The performing and visual arts are the treasures of any society. And yet many artists experience challenges in sustaining their gifts due to the lack of access to resources and support. Welcome to the Empowerment Zone with Ramona Houston, where we zone in on black and brown relations and our journey to empowering our communities. Join me today for a conversation as I talk with Grammy Award winning saxophonist Kebby Williams. As a creative, Kebby is a visionary as well. Kebby has all these great ideas on how we can make our city, the city of Atlanta, a nucleus for the arts. In fact, a mayor of a mayor elect of Atlanta, Andre Dickens, is one of Kebby's childhood friends. And Kebby has a lot of ideas he plans to share with them. According to Kebby, the city of Atlanta must be the catalyst in elevating the arts and empowering artists in Atlanta so that all may recognize Atlanta for the high arts. Hi, Kebby. Uh, welcome to the Empowerment Zone. Hey, how are you doing, Ramona? Thank you. I'm so uh, happy that you accepted my invitation uh, to be on the show. You're such an influencer influencer uh, in Atlanta, in our nation and world, and all the great work you do uh, through music is absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So um, before we get into this great topic you have chosen for today uh, about arts empowerment and creating an arts curriculum for the city of Atlanta, uh, I would uh, like you to tell our audience a little bit about yourself. You know, uh, given that personal and professional background is a great way for our audience to connect with our guests. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Kebby Williams, and I am from Atlanta. Um, went to Peyton Forest Elementary School, Southwest Middle School, Benjamin E. Mays High School. Um, I went to Howard University after that when I graduated high school. All of these are, all of this is black so far. I got my master's from Howard University, and then I went on to move to New York uh, to chase jazz dreams. And that's where I, I met the rest of the world um, and opened my horizons more. And then I, I began to start to tour as a jazz musician. And I wound up moving back to Atlanta. And then I moved to London and lived in London for almost a year. And then I uh, moved back to Atlanta again and moved to Amsterdam and came back to Atlanta and had some children. So since I had my kids, I've been in Atlanta and I've just been trying to make Atlanta as great as everything that I've seen in other places. And it is, of course, Atlanta is amazing. Um, but uh, I, I recently, a friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine, just became the mayor of the city of Atlanta. And it's a very exciting time. Um, so I'm just excited about making Atlanta the, the best place it could be, which I already believe it is one of the best places in the world for the arts. But I'm um, just interested in uh, arts development in, in cities, you know, mainly Atlanta, and that's what I that's what I'm uh, here to to talk to you. Wow, Kebby, I didn't realize uh, that you were a graduate. I should have known of one of the great historically black colleges and universities, Howard uh, University in Washington D.C., and I know you had. Uh, lived abroad, but I didn't know you had lived in so many different places. Um, and so uh, I, you not only have a local perspective of what's going on, but actually a global perspective on uh, music and uh, creating a uh, great city. So it's wonderful to hear that you are uh, a childhood friend of our new mayor of Atlanta. Um, you know, we're in an exciting moment right now with uh, the new, uh, the change in leadership. And, you know, I'm sure you have his ear and can really uh, influence the way uh, the city relates to jazz. So 
uh, and to the arts uh, in Atlanta. So what inspired you to really rethink how uh, Atlanta relates to the arts and jazz music? Well, I have to say that I am a jazz musician and um, music is my sort or uh, so to speak, or my tool uh, in the world of arts. And everything started with music. I was a music head, music nerd, you know, in high school, uh, church, uh, music, 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 music. Uh, and then when I went to college, of course, you had requirements to study the other arts. I had to study different tools, different things, visual arts. Um, and, but really what made me become an arts administrator was an accident that happened when I started my, um, my nonprofit. You know, my whole life was music. And there was a moment when in the West End neighborhood, things were starting to change and they're, they're still changing in our whole city, but neighborhoods were changing. And so our neighborhood at first, the West End 11 years ago, because my nonprofit has been going 11 years, 11 years ago was a very different neighborhood than it is today. It was still loosely dangerous, um, lots of drugs, you know, there was prostitution, crime, but there's also, there also has been, and still is, a large amount of culture in the West End. You know, Martin Luther King walked the streets of the West End, the AU centers in the West End. So this was my ground zero for thinking about arts in a larger sense of community and city. You know, what can the cities do? What can help the arts? What can help these neighborhoods? And so I, I um, selfishly, the way I started my, my, my nonprofit was totally a selfish thought of, I want to do a show. Let me see if I can get a grant to give me some money to do a show. And uh, the city of Atlanta, Camille Love and the city of Atlanta gave me a grant uh, 11 years ago. It wasn't a big grant at all to just do a Kebby Williams performance. You know, thank you, city of Atlanta for that. So when I did that performance, I just wanted to do an orchestra. I wanted to do, I wanted to have a symphony. Lots of artists do that. Like, they have a, a big record, and the next thing you know, they're doing their songs with a symphony orchestra. I wanted to do that, because I had songs. So I called Atlanta Symphony, and they were like, yeah, we need $5 million to pay all of these professionals. <laughs> cool. hey, can't do that. And so I thought, how can I get my idea off? Let me just call some students. Not thinking about education, not thinking about the students learning anything. It was a completely selfish thought. like. I need to get somebody to pull off this orchestra for me. So I called some teacher friends of mine. We got some youth to come and be the orchestra. And then what happened, what happened after that changed my life. And it changed the neighborhood of the West End too, because I got my pro friends out, professionals. I had Otil Burbage, Kofi Bur Burbage, Miguel Atwood Ferguson came out, Russell Gunn. D'Anthony Parks played drums that time. You know, all my really serious genius pro professional friends came out, but the kids were the orchestra. So when we were having rehearsals, I realized it instantly. When we first had our first rehearsal with the kids, it's like, they're learning. Wow, they're loving this. And they are actually learning from us. We're not even thinking about it, but just being in the same room with us, they're absorbing all of this. And not only that, we learned too, and we got something from them. And we learned that, wow, you know, as artists, we're so caught up in winning a Grammy, being the greatest, making history, showing the world how great we are. We sometimes forget that you have to share that. You have to share with what you are and who you are to the next generation so that your art form doesn't die. And jazz, you know, is one of those art forms that we all fear, you know, of losing. And there, and there are more art forms than just jazz. I mean, even just live music as a whole, there's fears of, of losing. Mm -hmm. Everything is like electronic and rap and a producer, and it's not mm -hmm. even any bands anymore, even in, in different, like rock and pop. And mm -hmm. So, you know, the only way to maintain culture and arts is to sh share it with the next generations. And I never really thought about that. And I know that a lot of my friends never really thought about it until we experienced it. So... The professionals grew, the children grew, 
And then when we did the show, the very first show I did, we had homeless people crying. Because at mm. that time in the West End, you know, in Buckhead and the rich neighborhoods, sure, you'll see a symphony orchestra playing out in the park. Mm -hmm. You'll see some ballet dancers. You'll see some jazz. You'll see a big band, jazz band in Roswell playing at the square. Because that's what happens. In Europe, I saw that all the time. I, I saw an opera singer just doing something outside. Um, you know, rich people understand the value. Poor people can't afford it. A, a poor person can't afford a $20 ticket or a $50 ticket to see a symphony or, or anything. So I gave this different music to our neighborhood in the West End. You know, at, at that time in the West End, you know, you had reggae, you had rap. But what you would hear walking down the streets of the West End on a normal day, 11 years plus ago, would be rap coming out of somebody's car, maybe some reggae, maybe some R&B, maybe some gospel. And that's what the streets of the West End heard. And I'm walking the streets of the West End and I'm into jazz and classical and all these other things. And then we have all these issues in the neighborhood with these low vibration art forms of like gangster mm -hmm. rap and mm -hmm. low vibrational sound in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know, sex, rap, drugs, you know, mm -hmm. that's what's getting played in the neighborhood. So we did our show out in the park that everybody walked to in the park that we did our first show in, like the kids used to sell drugs at the basketball court, the young kids. So now these young teenagers who are dropouts and drug dealers are seeing other young teenagers, you know, little girls playing the violin, same age. They like those little girls. What are they doing? <laughs> you know, they see other kids you know, doing something else. Mm -hmm. They saw it, they noticed. The homeless people, they, I had a homeless person come up crying like, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I never heard anything like this and it was so great. It was so beautiful. Like we mm -hmm. heard so much of that. So when that happened, the neighborhood didn't let me stop. <laughs> my initial idea was I just want to do a cabbie show, a dope cabbie show, you know, and it was much bigger than that, you know, outside of, like God has a bigger plan than we could ever conceive mm -hmm, of, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, on our own. And um, and so then we started to do it, and that's when I got into my arts administration hat. And it was a struggle; it's been tough. You know, I, I'm a musician first. I didn't go to school for administration, business, or anything like that. But because of necessity, you know, to raise up the neighborhood, we we got into that. And then we've had lots of successes since then, and. Fast forward to now, you know, we've done it 11 years. We've had some very good successes and we've had some failures. You know, we've been rained out a lot. We've had some, but we've had lots of great success. Some of our children are famous now. Like some of the kids who started out with us are actually famous now, mm. <laughs> you know, like, mm. like Morgan Guerin and, and Devin Gates and other people are like, they were kids playing with us. Mm. Um, but anyway, so but that brings me to the situation where I'm at now is like, when I was at Howard, my mind was um, jazz studies and my master's was in making, making curriculums for jazz studies programs at other colleges. And so now that my friend is the mayor of the, of the city of Atlanta, you know, I'm thinking, you know, he's my good friend. Like if I just said, hey, Andre, what do you think about blank, blank, blank? He would listen to me as opposed to if I went to Trump or anybody who didn't know me, even Biden, like, yo, can I get in a meeting? Yo, we should do this. You know, he doesn't know me. Is he going to listen? I don't know. But I know that Andre would listen if I had something that was a good idea. So that brings me to the question of, you know, what should a city do to raise its artistic imprint and the, the benefits and the healing powers of the arts uh, to bestow that upon your city? Because there are cities that are known for the arts, like New Orleans, Austin, Texas, New York, Chicago. Nashville, Memphis, these cities are known for their music, you know, and Atlanta is known for music, but it's mostly the billion dollar rap industry, which we control. I mean, we're on the top of that. But <laughs> like the West End 12 years ago, I wanted to show the city that there's some other things that are beautiful and that you need. That's not just rap, you know, sex, drugs, gangster you know, like, what about other things that, that uh, can benefit our whole community, the youth, the homeless, the crime, the crooks, 
the crooks like music too. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, when that crook is feeling bad and feeling like I'm finna knock somebody over the head and they walk down the street and hear some beautiful um, classical music, maybe that their mood might change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because, but you know, you know what I'm saying? So I am, you know, my headspace nowadays is what can we do as a city to advance and expose arts, bring the arts out. You know, I do believe that many politicians don't value art because you don't, you can't see the return on the investment. It's yep. like, okay, I put my money in the airport, we get money back. Yep. I put my money in a sculpture downtown, what am I getting for it? You can't mm-hmm. see what you're getting for it, but <laughs> your, your people are getting from it. Yep. And so like, when you're dealing with the politician and the importance of the arts, you know, it's almost like you have to, I don't know, you have to be a, a speaker, writer, you know, psychologist, you know, something more than an artist to make them understand the power of arts. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I like. That's what my headspace is now, like arts in the cities and bringing out the arts and the power of the arts. And what should a city do with arts budgets? You know, I've heard that some cities have Arts budgets, and they don't know what to do with the money. And I think this has happened in Atlanta, and then they've had to give money back because it's like, I, you didn't spend it. You know, and me as an artist, make, that makes me cringe. Like, yeah, exactly. You know, artists <laughs> want, want to do things and they just don't know what to do. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and really making the yeah. funding accessible to artists is really Im- Im- important. Like you say, why should you give this money back when? Uh, art, a lot of artists could use that to do some exceptional work uh, uh, musically, uh, artistically, as well as in the community such as yourself. And a lot of times artists uh, don't go for the grants because they don't know uh, uh, that the grants exist and they or know. they don't know how to actually do all the administrative work behind getting the grant. Uh, and that right. all has to do right. with accessibility, mainly accessibility. So um, I really appreciate you giving us that background on your professional growth and trajectory and how uh, you uh, put it in the context of really starting off in a in a selfish kind of idea, but it, it, it became much bigger and even more da- dynamic and impactful than what you ever realized. And it became ongoing. So now that we have uh, mayor-elect Andre Dickens in office and you being his friend and really wanting him to really embrace uh, uh, the idea of Atlanta being a, a, a center for the arts beyond uh, just like you stated, uh, the low vibrational music. Uh, not that all, uh, uh, not that all uh, rap is low vibration. I know that's not what you're saying, but we we do know what you're talking about when you're talking about certain elements of rap uh, that um, highlight uh, the most um, negative aspects of our our communities uh, and really bringing forth. Uh, high vibrational music, uh, such as jazz and 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 classical and uh, many other genres of music. So uh, let's say um, you do uh, get that ear of Andre, which we know you already do do have, Mayor Elect Andre Dickens. What are some of the ideas that you think the city could uh, incorporate, embrace, and actually actualize? Uh, in order to uh, make Atlanta a center uh, for the arts? Well, I definitely love what you said about accessibility. <clears throat> you know, initially, um, now I'm going to bounce off of your idea, but before I got the idea from here, as you said, I was, I, I was thinking about like how many artists are here who don't even know how to fill out a grant, don't know the grants mm-hmm. are available. Mm-hmm. And on the flip side, the city, has money to give to artists and they don't know who all to give it to. They give it to, they give it to, and then that's not enough and then they have to give money back. So there's a divide between artists and administrators in the city. And I think that there should either be programs or a street team of people to 
get the numbers and the information of artists. When you see a person selling jewelry on the street or selling his paintings on the street, somebody should be getting his number. And it's like uh, the city should know who all our artists are, no matter, not just the greatest ones who are traveling the world and have records out, you know, like all of the artists, you know, that are just trying to do something. And because if you're not this great international artist, maybe you will be one day. And if you had some help and support that could help you be greater, you know, and so instead of judging the lower or the folk artists or the people who are self-taught, but they're artists, you know, we need to know who all these people are and be able to contact people when we have opportunities for, for people. So a registry from the city, just knowing who people are, classes, you know, seminars. And I, you know, I, I'm into the grand game now and they do have instructional uh, seminars if you're in the know. But we just getting people in the know, I think, is extremely important, you know. Um, and then, you know, I would I would suggest that the city pays more attention to nonprofits and the the organizations that are already here and all the grassroots or organizations, like actually having some conversations with them about what what they think would make them better, and. Um, you know, more support to the, the, the organizations that are here already. And then thirdly, the education piece, you know, like I love like the Atlanta Music Project. They have like a um, after school program that kids can come and learn how to play instruments and classical music. Those types of programs are great, essential. Um, it may be hard to give high school music programs money from the city or maybe not. I don't know if, if public schools are federally funded or locally funded but like definitely more music in the schools and, and a focus on arts, you know, like my, my nonprofit music in the park, I have ideas of like all these boys who are dropping out of school and selling drugs, you know, a lot of the people in jail have rhythm, can rap, can make beats. They might not have a detention span to learn 12 scales and the violin and the fingering positions on the piano and sit down and go to a piano teacher for two years before they can actually play a song because they have to learn so much things that may seem boring. They might not feel like they have that kind of time, but they rap, they sing, they make beats on the playground and at the drug, at the trap house. You know, I was thinking that we could have programs like where kids learn how to make rap and make beats, but it's like an after school program because a lot of times we think about after school programs and like learn how to play music means learn a piano, learn a violin. You know, and that turns a lot of kids off. There's no violin in their music that they listen to. There's no real piano in the music they listen to. There's no drum set in the music that they listen to. You know, so more programs that could relate to the youth more so. Um, but definitely those were the three, three things that I would like to elevate, you know, maybe support for in cities is definitely the youth programs for the arts, the nonprofits, Support your nonprofits that are in the arts already. And um, I forgot what the first thing I said was. The, the, oh, the, yeah. The, oh, yeah. The, Finding the artist, the actual artist. Yeah, exactly. You know, mystery <laughs> artist. Like, I'm a mystery artist. Like, a lot of my friends are mystery artists. A lot of my great friends who are on tour internationally have never gotten a grant from the city to do a project in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Lots of them. Mm -hmm. I can, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say most of my friends that tour the world and are internationally known in Atlanta, few of them, maybe one out of 10, have gotten a grant from the city of Atlanta. You know, now they may have played at the jazz festival because someone is smart enough to know that they're great. So like Camille, somebody might say, hey, come play the jazz festival. But has that artist ever known how to look up a grant and do some kind of special project that he wanted to do on his own? I don't think so. And oh. I think that we need to be communicating with our art, you know. You, you know, you have some great ideas. And, and when I was um, referring to accessibility, as you um, stated, accessibility is all about the knowing. You right. have to know uh, that 
resources exist. And right. then you have to know how to access those resources. That's what accessibility is all about. And, you know, you talking about some of your ideas for mayor elect Andre Dickens, uh, it really expands on accessibility and much, much more, um, you know, that street team idea, you know, it's a lot of unknown artists. And we really in the city of Atlanta need to build a database of yes. all the artists that exist so we can tap into their uh, talents and not only that, support their talents. Um, your whole idea about supporting nonprofits that already exist and helping um, them to really flourish. A lot of nonprofits in, in the arts are really are hurting for resources and can't really uh, maximize their impact because of the lack of, lack of resources. And then lastly, I love the idea about youth, uh, youth educational programs. And, um, you know, all of us, myself included, was introduced to the arts at an early age, you know, and what, where would we be had we not been introduced to the arts? You know, the arts complement other um, professions in so many ways. Some right. of the people in, in the top of what, who are uh, the top in their field started off, off, you know, being introduced to music, you know, and and right. and and playing an instrument. So, I really, uh, I really, and I'm sure my audience really appreciates uh, these ideas. And I can't wait for you to uh, talk about talk to the mayor elect and and <laughs> and get his ear to get all this started. And of course, uh, Kebby, you know, I'm here for you in any kind of way. Uh, in order to help you implement those ideas. Um, that is what I do is social impact and uh, social impact projects. And it is great to hear all of these great ideas. And I cannot wait uh, for the new year when, when I'm sure we'll see many of these ideas come into fruition. Yeah, you mean, you know, like maybe a union, so to speak, like, I don't know if a lot of people, like, I think the union is for classical musicians now. Like, I don't think... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the 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 folk artists or the the self-taught artists even imagines being able to be a part of some kind of music union and mm -hmm. i think that is so old and antiquated of a system uh you know i don't even think it makes sense because like if i wanted to do a gig at say the old famous churchill grounds uh back in the day you know and if i would have gone to sam and said hey man i'm a part of the union you gotta give me five hundred dollars Sam couldn't pay me five hundred dollars because you know only thirty people came to the show, uh, you know. So that the, the way that the union works for artists, I don't know if it's something that really works for a certain level of artists. You know, maybe if you're on a, a television artist or a television star, yeah, I need at least so and so and so. I'm gonna stick the union on you, but you know, maybe there's time for uh, maybe we need a different sort of union because when you sign up for the union, the idea is that you're protected and that you're gonna be treated fairly, you're gonna be paid correctly. That was the concept of the union. You know, my example of Sam not being able to pay me, whatever the union says, is real as well. So maybe it wouldn't be the exact same paradigm, but maybe we should, at least the registry aspect of a union. So if you wanna be a part of the union, you gotta sign up and then you get these benefits. Now, maybe the, the type of union that we could start wouldn't, be monetary benefits in the sense of like every time you do a gig, you're going to get so and so amount of money. But if you've signed up for this union that we're doing, we're going to send you carrots and we're going to send you information about what you can do. And you'll be in the know about what opportunities are available for you. You know, and I, I think that wouldn't be a hard thing to do, man. I mean, yeah, that, maybe that it sounds, would be hard. I don't know, but it's good. This is not fair. Yeah, that sounds uh, like a good idea. And like you said, we have to reconceptualize all these ideas, you know, in terms of making it for uh, the current uh, world we live in. Like you said, some of this stuff is outdated the way it operates. And uh, a lot of artists, the type that you're talking about, the local artists, the folk artists, you know, the people who are self-taught don't have access uh, to some of these um, 
other types of resources such as the union. And so it is, it's time to reconceptualize that idea as well. So Kebby, we really, really enjoyed having you on the show. Um, I'm sure uh, you even brought your, um, your uh, fan base here at the Empowerment Zone. So if anybody wants to get in contact with you or assist you in your um, efforts in any kind of way in the arts, how would they uh, uh, reach you? My website is for our nonprofit is www.musicinthepark.atl. Don't forget the ATL part. Musicinthepark.atl.org. And um, there's a link to the gallery 992 space. Soon we're, we're going to have our own separate gallery website. But for now, you can see everything on the Music in the Park website. And then on social media, um, I'm Kebby Williams on Facebook, Instagram. And also the gallery has uh, an Instagram. It's gallery 992 ATL on Instagram and gallery 992 on Facebook. Sounds great. So we'll make sure that uh, we provide this information uh, when we post your episode, but you can reach Kebby at musicinthepark.atl.org. Thank you so much, uh, Kebby, for joining us. We wish you the best uh, as you continue to make an impact in the community. And congratulations for your friend, your childhood friend, Andre uh, Dickens winning the mayoral race, and he will be mayor of elect. Mayor, he is mayor elect of Atlanta, and we look forward to um, his term and his leadership in uh, 2022 and beyond. It's exciting. Me too. Thank you. A special thank you to the incredible team of the Empowerment Zone: Terry on Gully theme song, Nad Works digital support. And of course, our featured guest. If you enjoyed my podcast, please subscribe. We are on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts too. Thank you for your continued support.